want to continue in the series uh, that we as a church are engaged in, uh, going through the book of Colossians, uh, today looking at Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 to 23. We've set out on this short letter by Paul to find the sacred within the secular. I started us out, uh, I think it was four weeks ago, with a look at Christ and the workplace. Uh, Robbie and David have continued at that thread, and today we want to take up with verse 21 and consider that driving force behind all of this. Just what is it that demands that we uh, uh, identify and follow certain rules living, for living with our spouses and our, our kids and our bosses and our masters, whoever they may be? And the answer can be given in one word. Well, two words if I include the article, the, uh, the gospel. That's, that's what it is that drives us. And I hope by now that this is not a new word to anyone here this morning. Uh, we are a people saved by the message of the gospel. We're dedicated to taking that gospel to every corner of the earth and, and living according to that gospel that's revealed right here in God's word. Now, if I were to ask you to tell me what is the gospel, uh, I believe most of you could uh, answer something like this. The gospel, it's, it, it's the good news of Christ's birth, the Son of God incarnate, the one who lived the perfect life, was crucified on the cross, and by so doing took on the sins of the world, which includes yours and mine. He conquered death. Uh, he rose from the grave. He lives today at the right hand of God and is, in fact, God himself. In his time, he'll return uh, to answer once and for all the question that's paramount in every generation. If there is a God, why doesn't he do something about suffering and injustice? The answer is coming. Uh, I'll unpack that a bit more. If you want to unpack it yourself, you can flip over to the last book uh, in the Bible, Revelation, particular chapter 5, verse 7, which is the pivotal point of the entire Bible. Everything leads up to Revelation 5, 7. At that point, the music changes from minor to major. The lights come up and you just know it's going to be all right. Revelation 5, 7 is when Jesus reaches out and takes that scroll the scroll that has all the answers about all the judgment that's headed our way. But that's another sermon. In these three short verses in Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 to 23, we're going we're gonna to see the reasons for the gospel. Why did God seem it necessary in the first place to put the events of the gospel story into motion? Let's read those verses, shall we? Got them up here for you. Look in your own Bibles. Colossians 1, beginning with verse 21, once you were alienated from God and you were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope, held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. You know, one of the things I find really fascinating that I shared with you four weeks ago is the fact that there is indeed a sermon in everything. You don't have to be a preacher to see it. That is woven in and through the fabric of everything around us. That part of life that we call secular. You never have to look far to find the sacred. Whether it's in society's structures of family, school, work, play, this indescribable miracle of creation from the smallest atom to the farthest constellations in the universe. The words of Psalms 19.1 echo through every generation. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. And with your permission, I'd like to illustrate this message by sharing just a bit of the experiences leading up to the establishment of Marsh Antony Incorporated in the hopes that it'll help point 
to what this letter is laying out for us. And here are four keys to help keep us on track here. The first key, this, is the plan. Following that is the means. After that, the aim. And finally, the evidence. These are the things we're looking for in these few short verses of Scripture we read. Now, let me take you back <clears throat> to a Sunday night way back in 1967. I, I was a uni student, Colorado State University. Every chance I get, I would, I would travel about 90 miles back to my parents' house up in the mountains west of Denver. The fact that I, I brought my dirty laundry and several empty bags for groceries had nothing to do with my motivation. But that particular night, and I, I shared this story with some of you this week. Let me share it with you again because this is important. That, that Sunday night, I, I went to church with my folks, and I, I was invited to sing in the choir. It was a small church, and they were really desperate. And <clears throat> as people were fire, filing into the auditorium, I was sitting back there and uh, looking around and, and scanning the group as they came in, and I spotted a few guys I knew. I smiled and waved at them, and, and then all of a sudden, in the midst of this crowd, there sat before me this vision of loveliness, five feet, seven inches, blue eyes, blonde hair. You know how it is, guys, when just suddenly the whole world just focuses on that one point and, and I could see nothing else. Who was this girl? How had I missed her? Where did she come from? And, and in fact, you know, it, it, she was an out-of-town student as well. She went to a Christian high school way over in the state of Kansas and was just back home for the holidays. I didn't know that at the time. I, I only knew that this was a moment not to be underestimated and not to be missed. I even began considering entertaining ideas of how I might meet her afterwards and start up a conversation, you know, and, my eye, and, and as I was thinking, her eyes suddenly drift over and locked onto mine. At that point, I had one thought and one thought only, do something <laughs> Because I knew this moment was, was going to pass in another nanosecond. I had to do something. And so in desperation, I, I did the only thing that I could do. And I, I want to make it clear. I've never done anything like that before nor since. But I did what I had to do. I winked at her. <laughs> and listen up. Then This is the important part. Her response set the course of history. Because I think if she had returned my stare and winked back at me, I would have melted into the floor and looked for the nearest exit. But you know what she did? Her face turned about three shades of red, and she looked away like that. And when, when the last amen was said that evening, she was out of there. <laughs> Didn't talk to anybody. Well, I was left confused, but interested. <laughs> I said, here, here was a girl I wanted to know more about. I mean, and, and so from that moment, I started to develop a plan. I think you'll agree with me that plans are important, are you? Aren't they? In anything you do, you need a plan. As a wise man once said, if you don't know where you're going, you'll get there every time. All right, you have to think about that a bit. What plans guide the decisions that drive your life? Why are you here this morning? Was there a plan that brought you here? What do you expect to be doing next Friday night? One year from today, can you look back and say, yep, all according to plan? You need a plan. The Bible is rich with admonitions like this to think ahead and make a plan. Jesus himself, Luke uh, chapter 14, verse 28. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and make a plan? No, he says, estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it. Make a plan. Believe it or not, <clears throat> making plans does not indicate a lack of faith. I had a fellow student at seminary preaching class, and he, he said to the professor, he said, you know, I never plan what I'm going to say on Sunday morning. I just stand up and let the Holy Spirit lead me. Well, my preaching professor said, well, that's very commendable. But you know, the Holy Spirit could speak to you on Saturday night and give you a chance to pray about what you're going to say. 
Well, that's it. It's a plan we need. Whatever you do as you live in a secular world, make plans. Plans that are based on sacred values. You'll be a better person for it. Even God has plans. Colossians 1, 19 to 20. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or things in heaven. Now, they, I've mentioned this before, but this is the proof text that yes, dogs do go to heaven because God's going to bring it all back to himself. God's perfect world, the one that he himself declared very good back in Genesis 1.31, was now broken. Sin had made its way through Adam. Things were beginning to fall apart from a molecular level on up. And it wasn't just a physical breakdown. Attitudes were demented as well. Paul declaring in Colossians 1.21 that we had become alienated, enemies from God to the point we, we were his enemies as a result of our evil behavior. You look around the world today and you'll see people who seem to be at, at peace and harmony with all things. And you ask that person about God and they'll say, well, God is whatever you want him to be. For myself, I'm content to just sit here in this peaceful place and be at one with nature. Don't believe it. Don't believe it for a minute. Behind every mask of serenity, there lies a heart at war. That's a promise. All who reject their creator are going to find it impossible to live for long in harmony with anything. I think history will bear that out. More damning words have never been spoken than through those spoken by God himself through the prophet Jeremiah. Chapter 6, beginning with verse 13, where he said, From the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. Prophets and priests alike, all practice deceit. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. Are they ashamed of their detestable conduct? No, they have no shame at all. They don't even know how to blush. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. And then he goes on to say, but you said we will not walk in it. We are a people at war with ourselves. But God has a plan for making things right. I, I had a plan for approaching that vision of loveliness who escaped uh, from like Cinderella from the castle that night. But you know, unlike Cinderella, Marcia didn't leave a glass slipper behind. My plan was to make contact with her and introduce myself to see if, well, she might consider me a person of worth. Getting back to God. Getting back to God. Not only did God have a plan to reconcile all creation back to himself, he also had a means to do it. Chapter 1, verse 22. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Through Jesus, God was able to accomplish for us what we could never accomplish for ourselves. That is forgiveness for our sins. And, you know, you think about that. I think it's a mark of God's regard for his creation that he did allow us several generations to try and fix things on our own. Otherwise, we would have always insisted that, you know, we could have done this. We could have worked it out. But for generation after generation, the Old Testament is a comprehensive record of mankind's attempts and failures, attempts and failures to bring us back out of this broken mess that we had made of things. And finally, in the end, man just had to take a breath and say, we can't do it. 
We need a Savior. Enter Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, and the gospel story. God had a plan, he had the means, and he had an aim in mind. Chapter 1, verse 22, the last part of that verse, to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Now make no mistake, God did not look at the mess that we had made of things and send Jesus to make it right and then tell us, now go back outside and try to behave. No. God's plan included raising us up to the level of sainthood. Now, a lot of people think of saints as people who lived really good lives, and then they, when they died, they were given some special status, maybe as someone who could put in a good word for us to God. That's a lot of the world's image of what a saint is. But you know, that's not sainthood in the biblical sense. Your status as saint begins the moment you confess your sins and invite God's Holy Spirit into your life. You don't get a cool halo like these guys have. You don't get a cool halo that follows you around, as some of the Renaissance artists may suggest. But you know what? You do get a set of credentials. It sits right up there in the face of Satan. Satan is known as the accuser. And that's what he does best. He finds every flaw you've ever had, every flaw you thought you had, he gives it a good shove right into your heart, and then he twists it. And he's, you're left bleeding out on the floor, and the words of your accuser are the only things you can hear. You are pathetic. You've never been any good. You never will be. You're a fool if you think he would love something like you. That's what Satan does. And he does it good. If you've never heard those words, then count yourself most blessed. If you're a child of God, then you need never hear those words again, ever. Because as soon as the devil approaches you, and he will, 1 Peter 5, 8 reminds us that your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Take note, it doesn't say looking for someone to humiliate, looking for someone to trip, someone to hurt, someone to give a hard time to. No, he's looking for someone to devour. Satan wants nothing less than your very soul. But listen, as soon as he comes close to you, the first thing he's going to see are your credentials. And the first thing he's going to hear will be the voice of God saying, Back off. This one is mine. This letter to the Colossians assures us that God has a plan for you. He has the means to accomplish that plan. That is Jesus Christ and him crucified. He has an aim in mind, that of raising you to sainthood status. Now going back to my own situation, I, I had a plan. I wanted to get to know Marsha better, uh, and thanks to Sherry sitting here tonight with her sister, and thanks to my mom, I had the means to put the plan in motion. We really were an arranged marriage when I think about it. Uh, <clears throat> I was in the kitchen at my folks' house, home for the holidays. My mom was cooking something up, two somethings actually. The first was obvious, the lasagna. The second was a little more subtle. As she worked away, she asked almost in passing, you know that girl at church, uh, Marcia Smith? Well, I felt the hair standing up in the back of my neck. <laughs> I tried to sound casual as I said, yeah, I, yeah, I think I know her. She's a cute thing, isn't she? Yeah, yeah, I suppose so. You should call her up sometime, ask her for a date. Yeah, maybe I will. I have to find her phone number. Mom didn't miss a beat. She reached into her pocket and handed it to me. <laughs> Said, I just happen to have it right here. Uh, unbeknownst to me, my mom and Sherry had been working on this for quite some time. So I had a plan. I had the means now. And underneath it all, I had an aim. 
if number, numbers one and two worked out, then I hope to see that aim accomplished. And that was to make the two of us an item. Now, it may sound a little presumptuous at this point to say that it was my aim at that point to marry Marcia and start planning our 50th wedding anniversary. Yeah. A lot had to be determined first, like whether or not we even liked each other. But I had been given some good advice along the way, and, and ever since I've tried to make it a point to pass that advice along to young people who, who will listen to me. And that advice is simply this, never date anyone that you know you could never marry. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Like, duh. Let me say that again. Never date anyone that you know you would never be able to marry. I, 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 how many times, how many times have I heard men and women cry to me, yeah, I knew they had that problem, but by the time I realized what a problem it was, we were too much in love to put the brakes on. It's, it's hard to say, harder to, to, to put into practice, to realize from the very beginning, this person is great, but we could never marry. Christians, non-Christians, radically different religious beliefs, extreme cultural differences, married, single. These, these are deal breakers from the very beginning. They should be. These are but a few of the first issues that have to be recognized and dealt with before that first date. Because the closer you become as a couple, the more insignificant those differences will seem until they're not insignificant anymore. The best way to avoid a world of hurt is to avoid those paths that you know will lead you into that world. Like I say, it's easier said than done, but I, I'm, I got to say it. And if, if, if this strikes any chords in you or to someone you love, try to keep that in your heart. I had a fair share of girlfriends throughout high school and college. She had a lot of boyfriends. Uh, did quite a bit of dating along the way, but, you know, in every case, as soon as I felt the furnace click on, I had to ask myself, could this girl someday be my wife? And I, I've shared this with you to you before, but, uh, you know, Marcia had, had made it her decision. She had made a commitment to, to go into full-time Christian ministry as a teenager. But she never told anybody, least of all her boyfriends, because she didn't want some boy coming along and say, yeah, I'm called into Christian ministry, let's get married. She didn't want somebody to do that. And so she never said anything. And we dated, and the, and the first summer we dated was kind of okay. The second summer, she treated me like yesterday's news. She would have nothing to do with me. She said it was because I was a Texan, but she was lying. Uh, but not until God miraculously called me into full-time Christian ministry as she was praying for me a few hundred miles away. At that point, then the secret came out and we got married. But I, I have to respect the decision that she made and, and the, the strength she did to turn down a, a handsome hunk like me uh, because at that point, I was someone she could never marry. Well, in, in some cases, the answer is instant, instantly obvious like that. Putting the skids on, on relationships like that at the very beginning is, can be painful, but listen, it, it can be exponentially more painful if they're allowed to go farther and deeper. Now, having an aim in all aspects of your life, including this process of boy-girl relationship, is, it's very important. And that's what we're here all about today, is to know that kind of life at its fullest. Jesus promised us in John chapter 10, verse 10, I'm come that they might have life and have it to the full. That's what Jesus wants for you. Not just life, but a full life. Having an aim is a divine example of God's dealing with you and me, his most precious creation. And all of that is made relevant by the fourth and final step of God's work in the world. 
His work with the people of the church of Colossae and his work in our lives today is the evidence. Here's the evidence that Paul offers in verse 23. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel, this is the gospel you heard that been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and which I, Paul, have become a servant. Now, you may be among some of those who have struggled with this verse, quite honestly, since it seems to say here that your salvation is not a done deal. It sounds like that there are conditions being placed upon your status as a loved one and a forgiven saint. If you continue in your faith, if you are not moved, then perhaps God will remain yours. A lot of brothers and sisters over the years have read this and fallen into despair. I thought I was secure in the arms of Jesus. Turns out I was wrong. Well, let me say two things here. I hope will help. The first thing is to dig out your Greek Bible, your notes and your websites. Jonathan, you down there? I saw you, yeah. Jonathan Fothergill has, has started a semester of Greek. Listen, my heart goes out to you. But hang in there, buddy. It's, it's worth the effort. Because what the Greek geeks will tell you here is that in the New Testament, the English word if appears a little over 550 times. But, and this is significant, that word translated in English as if actually comes from three different Greek words. There's Allah, Aeon, and A, and they're all translated if. Now, Allah uh, it can be seen in such places as Matthew 5, 39. If anyone slaps you on, on the right cheek, then turn to him the left. And the best translation for this, in this instant, Allah, Eve, is even though. Allah, someone slaps you on the right cheek. Even though someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the left. But in the English, we just read if. Aeon is seen in such places as Matthew chapter 6, verse 14. If you forgive those who sin against you, then your heavenly Father will forgive you. Unfortunately, that word if means just what it says. If, then. Scary verse, another sermon someday. A is seen in places such as in today's passage. Colossians 1.23 if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. Notice here, there is no then which follows, like we see back in Matthew. And that's for the simple reason that it's a different word. I don't want to bog us all down on a lot of Greek, but in this case, it's important. Now, Jordan, your, your teacher will tell you that this verse here is a first-class conditional sentence accompanied by an indicative mood. That's a mouthful. But that's all to be said that that word is best translated since. Not if, but since. And that makes a heap of difference in the way we read this verse. Now it sounds like this, beginning in verse 22. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body, through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish, free from accusation. And now watch this part. Since, since you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. What we see here is the fourth and final step describing God's work in the hearts of his people. And that is the evidence of that work. The people to whom Paul was writing were a people forgiven. By the blood of Jesus. They were made holy as a result of God's aim in doing so. And the result is a church that is vibrant. It's alive. It's working. It's becoming all they were established to be. Any doubts? Just look at them, says Paul. There is the proof. Look at that church. Now, I said I wanted to say two things, and believe it or all, not all I said was just one thing. Here's the other thing. If the word if... And verse 23 is a problem for you, or for that matter, if any other verse of Scripture seems to be throwing a spanner into your understanding of who God is. Keep in mind this fundamental rule of interpretation, a fundamental rule. 
Anyone who engages in any kind of Bible study should be aware of this rule. There's even a Latin word for it if you want to sound smarter. The word is analogia scriptura. Doesn't that sound great? Analogia scripture, but it's just a fancy way to say this. No passage of scripture properly interpreted will contradict any other passage. Okay? You may think, well, what about? No, no. Interpret scripture by scripture. It will never contradict itself. If it looks like it's contradicting, then there's something you're missing there. When we let Scripture interpret Scripture, it's clear that our salvation is made possible by God's plan, by God's means, by God's aim. If you follow the steps given over in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that is, if you have confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you believed in your heart God did raise, was raised Jesus from the dead, then by all authority that Scripture has to offer you, you are His precious child. And you will remain, I thank you for that amen, you will remain His child for eternity. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. Romans 8, 38, I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, or anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. You can't say it any plainer than that, can you? Don't let any verse of Scripture sound like it's contradicting that, because it's not. There is no if-then proviso here. There is no legal loophole whereby God might find a way to keep you out of his kingdom. Now, I have to add this. Keep this in mind. Scripture is speaking here to those who have believed the promise, who have confessed their sins, who have invited God's Holy Spirit to come and live in their hearts. If you've not done that, and in this case, if means exactly what it says. If you have not done that, if you've never given your heart to Jesus, then these scriptures are simply not speaking to you. It's harsh to sound, but it's true. It's not written for you. I can direct you to some scriptures and others that are speaking loud and clear to your situation. But that's another sermon. Let it suffice to be said... If you'd like to know more about this, stick around today. There are dozens of people in this church who would consider it an honor and a privilege to share those scriptures with you and to bring you into the family of believers so that you can take this communion as a part of the body of Christ. Scripture is declaring loudly and clearly, your life is the proof of your salvation. I mentioned this in the first message in this series. As Christians, yeah, we work for the kingdom. But we don't do that in order to win a place in heaven, as much of the world today tries to do. Much of the world today operates on this principle of the big scale. Here's all my good stuff, and here's all my bad stuff. And when we die, we're going to go before God, and he's going to look at that scale. And the nightmare is that he'll look at it and say, I missed it by that much. No. That's not the way we live. We work not to work our way into heaven, but we work because it's the natural result of who we are. Doing good for us is as natural as breathing. So let me try to put this together in, in a short summary. Colossians 1, 21, 23. This is the foundation upon which the rest of the book rests. God is doing what he's doing because first, he had a plan. He has a plan from the very beginning to reconcile all things back to himself. He has a means of accomplishing that. In a word, Christ crucified. He has an aim in mind, not just to save us from our sins but, and keep us out of hell, but to make us holy to put a stop once and for all to any claim Satan might think he has on us. And he has evidence to prove what he's accomplished. 
For the folks reading this letter, it was the church itself. There in Colossae, living, working, vibrant. That was the proof. For us here this morning, that proof is you. You are the proof of what God is doing in his people. You know what I'm talking about. Those who are those living sacrifices that Romans 12 and 1 talks about. If you need something a little more contemporary to illustrate this passage, keep in mind that that I began with a plan to get to know Marcia better. I had the means. I had that slip of paper with her phone number on it. I had an aim to see whether we could move into a relationship that someday could lead to marriage. And it's taken 50 years, but I can now demonstrate the proof of God's blessing on that process. And that's another example of finding the sacred in the secular. I think any of you could look around and find similar examples in and around your own lives. And I pray this morning that God would give you a blessing of the vision to see those things in and around you. You know, back in 1797 in London, a man by the name of Edward Moat was born. His parents ran the local pub. Edward was mostly left to his own devices. He was trained as a cabinet maker. And then at the age of 18, he found Jesus. After 37 years as a carpenter, he moved into the ministry. He served as a Baptist preacher. He was so well-liked and respected that the church offered to give him the building. So this church, it's yours. But, you know, he refused it. He said, no, I don't want the church. He said, I will take the pulpit, though, which was a little fancier than this one. He says, I will take the pulpit, but only as long as I continue preaching God's word from it. He said, on the day I stop doing that, kick me out of it, take it back. And throughout his ministry, he dealt with men and women in his church who were struggling with the very same issues that we've talked about here today. Is there any assurance of God's salvation? Can I lose God's love and be rejected one day? And in reply, Edward Mote wrote the words that would eventually become a well-known hymn. If you don't mind, and, and music guys, you can work your way up here. If you don't mind, I'd like to uh, close this morning by letting us sing it together. It expresses what I want to say much better than I, I, I ever could. The words begin like this. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand.